and welcome to Micro Live. In the show today, we attempt to get robots to play a decent game of table tennis. And Fred Harris discovers that portable computers can be used almost anywhere. Because there's a modern case of fish and chips. And I'll be talking to Douglas Adams, creator of the largest database in the galaxy. The introduction starts like this. Space, it says, is big, really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the street to the chemist, but that's just peanuts in space. Listen. And so on. Well, apart from Freff's flying visit to London, the other big news this month was the rescue of Acorn Computers, manufacturers of the BBC Micro, by Italian computer giant Olivetti. Later in the programme, we have an exclusive interview with the new chairman of Acorn, Alex Reed, who talks frankly about the future of the company. But first, some other news. This month saw the second reading of the bill to make this sort of thing illegal. Being software, that is. It's William Powell's Copyright Computer Software Amendment Bill, and it will improve the old Copyright Act, which was introduced in 1956. Well, if Mr Powell's bill gets passed, it will not only make the pirating of computer software a criminal act, but provide for the issuing of search warrants in the ruthless pursuit of wrongdoers. But what they'll do if they catch a ten-year-old schoolboy copying his mate's games, I just can't imagine. The computer industry now has its own fundraiser for Ethiopia. Soft Aid is a compilation of ten popular games on one tape for the Spectrum or the Commodore, masterminded by Quicksilver's managing director, Rod Cousins. It's already into its second production run, and at least three pounds of the 4 dollars selling price will end up going to the Ethiopian appeal. Band-Aid's hit single is also recorded on the tape. On March the 21st, Century Communications published The Hacker's Handbook, which claims to be a DIY guide to the secrets of the elite group of computer enthusiasts who enjoy the sport of breaking into other people's machines. Now, the book contains detailed accounts of the most sensational hacks of recent years, including the Telecom Gold hacker who struck during the first ever Micro Live. The author, Hugo Cornwall, didn't want to appear on the program just in case he was recognised, but did speak to him last week and asked him if he had any doubts about the wisdom of encouraging more people to try their hand at hacking. He told us... Hacking is often confused in the public mind with fraud. It isn't. It's a sport for people who like to ramble through big computers without doing damage. Almost every example of computer fraud involves inside knowledge, whereas the information in the book is well known already. The onus for security is on the owners of computer systems. Well, here's another micro with the BBC logo on it. It's, uh, this time it's an 8-bit Z80 micro dedicated to only one thing, to help improve your game of bridge. And it's linked to the series Bridge Club on BBC Two. It costs £179, and in some ways it's reminiscent of the TV games machine we saw in years ago, before home micros came along, in that it has a keyboard specially designed just for one purpose. I reckon Mac's sweater is only dedicated to one thing, too. It was designed by a computer. Yeah, it looks like chess Mac. <laughs> now, most of the details of the Acorn saga are by now very well known. Olivetti injected just over £10 million in return for a 49.3% stake in the company. Olivetti also have an option to increase their holding to over 50%, effectively giving them complete control now. Acorn will be reorganised into four divisions with the loss of 120 jobs. Up to now, Acorn had been unwilling to speak publicly about the rescue, but last night, Alex Reed, the newly appointed chairman of Acorn, agreed to an interview for Micro Live. Alex, welcome to Micro Live. Firstly, it's rumoured that uh, several British companies, including your own company, British Telecoms, GC and Thorny MI, were interested in investing on, in Acorn. Mm. Why did you choose Olivetti? Well, firstly, Olivetti moved fast, but uh, secondly, we wanted a firm that would let us continue to run the company and was willing to take a minority. We wanted a firm that would pay the best price for the shares. And we were also looking for a firm that was complementary to Acorn and could bring something to the party. Did you look around for a British investor? Oh, we spoke seriously to at least half a dozen other investors, including some large British companies, yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me, let's go back a little bit. What do you think went wrong with Acorn that got it into its problems? Well, I ought to stress that the problem in January, and it was a very acute problem, was a cash flow problem. The company was still worth a, a lot, many millions of pounds, 
but we had a considerable pile-up of stock in our warehouse, and it's not possible to borrow money against stock in this kind of a business. The bills were coming due that had to be paid, and it was the cash that we needed. Now, the reason that happened was mainly because in November and December we did fall somewhat short of our sales targets in the Christmas sales of computers. We sold a very substantial number, but uh, not as many as we'd hoped. Another factor was the failure we had in the US market uh, earlier in 1984, where we made quite a bold attempt to enter the education sector in the US, but regrettably had uh, a few months ago to take a hard decision to uh, cut that back and pull out of the US market. So those are the two main factors. But I think that underlying those, we can now see looking back, and of course hindsight is very easy, that the company did simply try to do too much in 1984. We tried to enter too many markets, tried to develop too many products, tried to deal with too many technologies, operate in too many countries, and we overstrained, I think, the management resources and financial resources of the business. One of the trade papers here says that uh, media accused of causing panic. A wave of panic which has swept over the UK home computer industry in recent weeks has been blamed on seriously exaggerated reports in the British press. And Jane Bird, who's a journalist for the Sunday Times, must share the blame. D do, you, do you believe any of that? Do you think it adversely affected Acorn? I, I'm afraid I don't agree with that. I don't think there's been a panic. I think it's a, a sensational uh, word to use. Um, and nor do I think that the media have played a significant role in, mm -hmm. in at least our problems. I can speak for other companies. The BBC contract was very important to Acorn, clearly, mm -hmm. and you seem to have invested in the United States, you've invested mm -hmm. in the Electron, mm -hmm. which was trying mm -hmm. to get that very, mm -hmm. very tough home mm -hmm. micro market, mm -hmm. and we don't seem to have seen a lot of investment in the BBC micro. What are your plans for the BBC micro? Is it overpriced? Well, we've been working hard behind the scenes on new versions of the BBC Micro, and we certainly plan to bring those out before the end of this year. On price, the BBC Micro continues to sell very well, um, remarkably well, and it seems there are a lot of people out there who are willing to pay that price for a really good machine with good expansion capability. I keep hearing rumours, mainly from the press, of course, mm. of a B plus or something like that. Mm. Are you prepared to tell us anything about this? I'm sorry, we can't. Uh, what I can say is that we have got further and improved versions, but they're not imminent. We plan to launch them before the end of the year, but I'm afraid I can't say anything more than that today. And will they be compatible with my BBC Micro? Can I expect if I bought one, it's more powerful and I can still run all my programs? Um, they certainly will be. We've got a very large base out there of about 300,000 machines or more. And there's a lot of software, both professionally written and amateur software, already in use. And it's our aim in Acorn to provide our existing customers with an upward path through, uh, through add-ons and additional software, and to provide them with new machines which will be compatible with and can be net networked with the existing machines. Let's look at the home micro, the Electron. Hmm. You've got vast stocks of that, so it's rumoured. Um, are you continuing to manufacture the Electron? Yes, we are. We're continuing to manufacture it and, and will for some while. We certainly expect to offer the Electron as a product in our range through to the end of 1986 and uh, quite possibly beyond that. We think that at the price that it's now at, £120, it's very good value. Thank you very much, Alex. I hope all goes well for Acorn. Best of luck. Thank you very much. Well, one main challenge to Acorn's domination of the education market in Britain comes from research machines who had nothing more interesting than their RML 480Z with which to tempt the schools. Now here comes the new Nimbus with the speed of an IBM AT, a minimum of 192k of RAM and a starting price of under £1,000 for schools. There's a hard disk version for under 2000 The interesting extra to protect software when the Nimbi are networked together is this dongle. It acts as an ignition key to activate programs which only certain number of people have access. The last few years have seen some remarkable challenges to the many hobbyists who like combining their hardware and software skills together in robotics. Now, for some reason, the British tend to be quite successful at this. Don't know why. <laughs> The early 80s saw an annual competition to produce a self-propelled micro-mouse. Its task, to find its way through this micro-maze. And here's the Sterling Mouse, up till now the champion. After a tremendous performance in Paris... 
each year produced more and more sophisticated results, often using software which could learn the shape of the maze by experience. Though some entries seem to have quite bad memories. Two years ago, BP's Build a Robot competition was for a device to detect a cube from some distance away, pick it up, and then carry it back behind the start line. There were many different approaches, some using onboard home microcomputers, others used nothing but specially designed homemade electronics. Including the winner, by the way. And this was the only software it needed. Screwdriver. And last year, the British Computer Society challenged people to produce a voice-controlled robot capable of doing some useful task related to an industrial process. Release. And uh, here is John Billingsley of Portsmouth Polytechnic, uh, the man behind the micro-mouse competitions, you might say, because he was the organiser of the original ones but John this year you've dreamt up something which seems well to me quite impossible well it's got to seem impossible I mean to say what mountaineer would want to climb an easy mountain true uh, and this sort of problem which is robot ping-pong is really going to have the young engineers going <laughs> by um, 2nd of July I think you better explain yourself fully John right if you're going to have a robot which plays ping-pong the mm. first requirement is it's got to hit the ball mm -hmm. uh, this is a super little model made by um, David Witt's team at Oxford University it shows that you can move the bat up, yeah. down, left, right, right. That's, and of course, that's, the bat, isn't it? that's yeah, right. Yes. Uh, and as soon as you're on the ball, you can fire it with a large solenoid in the middle. Yeah. And if you really want to flummox your opponents, you can swivel the bat and angle it and slice. Oh, it's got a spin. That's Fantastic. right. Now, of course, the thing is going to have to be designed to see the ball coming, isn't it? That's right. They've chosen to use sonar, which I think is a fairly difficult way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But they've got these three sonar detectors and they'll locate the ball in space. Right. How, do, how will they sort of coordinate the seeing and the hitting? Well, that's where the computer comes in, of course. Uh, um. a, robot, a, a computer has to coordinate the position of that ball mm. to the position of the bat. Uh, we haven't got a balsa wood computer here, but... Um, oh, it'll come, I'm sure. Okay. Let's have a look at a couple of full-sized robots, uh, practical robots. Um, we've got uh, Julian's team here uh, from Elmer Sands Bogner, yeah. and they, they've got a superb thing here, automatic ping-pong engine, Ape. <laughs> But before we have too much of a look at that, can, can I just tell you a bit more about how, yeah. having proposed something impossible, you cheat like mad to make it not only possible but almost easy. Um, you, you see, we've got a playing frame here, mm. which is only half a metre square. Right. The table's only half a metre wide, yeah. two metres long. Yep. So this is the sort of area that a robot will cope with. That's right. See and cope with, yeah. That's right. The 12 and a half centimetre bat... Well, it's a quarter of the size of that as it mm -hmm. moves around, yeah. so it, it all becomes quite possible. Right. And a black surface? A black That's surface essential. so that the ball shows up very easily to make it easy for vision systems. OK, now how does this beast move? Well, th this particular thing, it can move side to side mm. because it's two, got two motors down at the bottom there. Yeah. And it can move up and down by doing a glorious policeman's knees bend <laughs> by driving the motors I in opposing... I can't wait to see it. H how, does it uh, how does it see the ball coming at it? it can the ball because it's got four photocells in those areas yeah. uh, and this is the whole point if that particular photocell sees that more light than the other area it knows that the ball's in that direction so it goes in that direction right Careful any chance of a little look oh, I? oh I see what you mean gosh that's pretty violent isn't it yeah, very nice I like to see uh, yes all the mechanical moving well, I think parts Julian Griffin was letting you off lightly there yeah. because he this is very sophisticated this um, <laughs> High tension technology. Now, you know, you know. Thank you. What have we got at the uh, end of this the end? We, we've got a system from John Knight of Fairham near mm -hmm. Portsmouth, uh, and it's a superb thing. It's a sort of a kung fu action. Right. Uh, everything is wound up on springs, and as soon as it's ready to go, that releases, shoots forward. There, there's a little disc there with slots in, and when the computer's decided that it's got to the right position, mm. it slams the brakes on. Well, let's have a little look, can we? Let's, let's see if it'll do it. If I count down three, two, one, go. Oh, what? It tipped it. Very it tipped nearly. It. Very Eight out of nearly. ten for the smash, but how did it see the ball coming? It didn't see the ball coming. This one, we cheated a little. We used a bit of guesswork ah. on where the ball would arrive. Right. But it has got a vision system. And, and come the day, those two will be joined together, oh, the vision system and the action. They've got right. to be. But at the moment, the vision system's over there, and it consists of spinning 
discs with lots of superb cylindrical lenses focusing mm -hmm. the blob of the ball into a stripe, passing over photocells. Mm -hmm. And of course, a computer then has to sort out the image, mm -hmm. has to sort it all out so that it then can turn it into a spot in space to tell the robot, right. or a spot in the screen here, just so that we can see what's happening. Um, John over there, I think, has got a ball all ready to drop. When, whenever you're ready. And, and that's that. produced a nice pattern of spots on the screen showing that the computer knows where the ball yeah. is and can therefore tell the robot where to go. actually traced it down. Absolutely. I think that system actually owes something to uh, somebody who'd be quite familiar with the BBC. Absolutely, yes. It really is right out of Logie Baird's original mechanical scanner. It's come home to roost, in fact. It's come home. Do you know what impresses me about uh, both of these robots is the speed with which the mechanical parts move, because normally industrial robots, they're a bit lumbering, aren't well, they? Well, if you want to have a fast industrial robot, you certainly have to pay an awful lot of money. Mm. But not only are they fast, but they respond to what's going on. Now, if these young engineers can bring this sort of technology into the production area of robotics, they're going to push robotics into the next century. Could be a whole other ball game, John. Thank you very much. Over to you, Fref. Thanks, John, and the robot makers. The competition is open to anyone. If you think you'd like to have a go, write it in details. Working nights to buy. If you're someone who works in front of a screen all day, what factors affect your comfort and efficiency? The results of independent research into this question have begun to influence the makers of office furniture, like the American company Westinghouse. Very commonsensical, a lot of this. Uh, Tom Rosewall of Westinghouse explained the most important point about comfort is that you should be in control. First, you should be able to adjust the height and the angles of the various parts of your seat, preferably without having to get up. Again, if you were to reach into the Support of the small of the back and under the calves is particularly important to maintain a good blood supply. Right, yeah. All right. And what's this foot pad for under here? To elevate your, your feet. Yeah. Again, to try to get best blood circulation, you ideally want your knees just slightly higher than your bum. Right, I'm sitting comfortably, so what next? Okay, now that you are comfortable, we have to deal with the relationship between you and the screen. Now, there are a lot of features that are inherent to the screen itself. As you can see, it can swivel and it can tilt. It's, it's got funny gloss, isn't it? It's got funny gloss, and the gloss is there to uh, deal with the reflective glare. And also there's an inherent feature which allows you to adjust the dimness and the brightness of the screen, right. further reducing eye strain. The next thing then is to start dealing with the keyboard itself. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Now you want to make sure, first of all, that it's the right height. Uh, can I do that? You can. If you slip your hands underneath, you'll find a couple of levers. That allows you to move it up or yeah. down so that you're comfortable. The ideal situation mm -hmm. is that basically you have a, a 90 degree angle between your upper arm and your lower arm and your hands to the keyboard. Like that. that allows the blood to circulate most freely and makes you therefore comfortable uh, during the day. Can I put my wrists on this thing? Is that allowed? Yes, that's a, that's a palm support. Again, trying to maximize the comfort. Basically, if you were doing this for four or seven hours a day, you want as much support yeah. as you can ruin my typing style. No more of that. You're, you're still not quite ready. You're going to be typing from something. So here you have a copy holder. And you want to bring that okay. forward and make sure that the relationship, both vertically and horizontally, is consistent with the screen. So that you're not changing your focus each time you move your eyes from the screen to the copy. Yeah, well, in my case, the copy is usually lying on the floor underneath the chair. Well, this setup is obviously excellent for someone working with a computer seven or eight hours a day. But what can you offer the casual computer user? Well, for the occasional user, you can bring the screen into use when you actually need it. And through this mechanism, the same with the keyboard tray. That's very neat, isn't it? Do you know what? I'm definitely executive material. I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much, Tom. Well, those are some of the things that you and your employers can do to improve life with computers. But until there's new technology available, we are stuck with VDD.
blue screens. And the screens themselves contain certain characteristics which may or may not be responsible for some ailments. Now, current thinking is that radiation is not a hazard, but some other things may be. For instance, there's ionisation of the air around the screen. Some experts think that this ionisation can actually drain your energy. It certainly causes skin rashes, though with only 40 known cases in the entire world, it's hardly an epidemic. Then there's the actual appearance of the screen and its contents. The characters are made up of little tiny dots and they're not as easy to read as print, and this may cause headaches. Then there's the dreaded flickers. Now, all VDU flicker, that is, they, they blink at you at so many times a second. But with the newer business machines, like this Macintosh, they're working on American standards, that is, they're working at 60 cycles a second rather than 50. And they are much less flickery than British machines. Well, I can't see any flicker on this uh, screen at all, but our cameras can detect it. So you'll be able to see the flicker at home, and my brain is probably registering it, and my brain is probably quite irritated by it, even though I don't know it. Now, what the long-term effects of all this is going to be, no one really knows. Maybe the answer lies in the further refinement of liquid crystal displays like this one, which is really pretty crude at the moment. There have been speculation that working at a VDU can cause miscarriages among pregnant women. A survey done among Air Canada employees discovered that in one year, 7 out of 13 pregnant women using VDUs miscarried. The United States Department of Health then performed an intensive investigation into those findings in 1981 and found that the levels of ionization emitted by a sample of 53 screens was no higher than the normal level of ionization in the air. So, did working at a VDU cause the Air Canada women to miscarry? Experts think not. The fact is that some 20% of pregnancies miscarry naturally. As a large proportion of the people working at VDUs are women of childbearing age, they will have more pregnancies and consequently more miscarriages than a random sample of people. And this report didn't take into account other factors, such as job stress and environmental conditions. Well, the whole purpose of a portable computer is to be able to use it out of the standard office environment. Here's the husky from the bottom of the aquarium, and it's really none the worse for its dousing. I wonder what Archimedes would have discovered if he'd had one of these in his bath with him. Fred, what have you been looking at? Well, of course, portable simply means you can carry it about, and that means anything, really. We, but basically, there's three kinds. There's the transportable, like this mighty great flips over here. Now, this, this is really a desktop micro in a more convenient package. It's got disk drives, it's got traditional VDU, and, of course, a keyboard. That's at the big end. At the other end of the scale, you've got this, which is a, a pocket micro from Sharp. It's really just a clever calculator. Very limited memory, and you need a trained stick insect to work the keyboard for you. I think what most people think of as a portable is a lap held, rather like this one here from Epson. I met the president of Epson some time ago and he defined a portable computer as a, a computer that a child of 10 can carry for w one hour in one hand and it will last 10 hours and it's built in batteries. Well, they've certainly done it. I mean, this is very, very light. Nonetheless, it's quite sturdy. It'll take a few blocks, which it would have to, of course. Um, but it's also got a very, very nice keyboard. None of your ZX81 tat here. Despite the size of it, um, this as powerful as that mighty Philips over there. But what it hasn't got is the big power gobbling components, things like the disk drives and the VDU. This is battery powered and that really means a lot of compromises. And the first one, of course, is the screen. Now let's see if I can get you to see this. Something should come up. Let's just see if I can angle it. The problem with the liquid crystal display screen, which this is, is that it needs a lot of fiddling. Ah, there, we can just see something. This is the same sort of screen that you get, or same sort of players on a digital watch. Um, the problem is it doesn't emit light, it reflects it, and that means that you've got to play with the angle, you've got to play with the contrast to get it just right. I noticed when you switched on immediately something came up. Ah, yes, now we're on to storage. Well, I suppose everybody knows the problem of uh, playing, say, a, a game on a home micro and somebody comes and pulls out the plug, everything disappears, you've got to reload. Well, that would be disastrous on a portable micro. So, what they've done is they've used a form of storage called CMOS, which is traditional chip, but a very mm -hmm. low power version. And that means it can be backed up, all the data can be maintained by a tiny trickle of battery power. That's the main form of storage here, but this one has also got a nice little system here, a micro cassette, rather like the sort in uh, dictaphones. I suppose you could have a disk drive alongside and connect it in and then record it on that little cassette and use that when you're travelling about. Yes, indeed. But as you see, it's all, it's all a matter of compromise. What about the screen? It still looks fairly small, though, bigger than the one I'm used to. Yes, well, uh, they, this will soon become a thing of the past because the screens that are being produced now 
are this sort of size. Now, believe it or not, that is quite a substantial advance because although that's about three times the size, it's more than three times the complexity to make it. It's really a, a mammoth integrated circuit. And this. does it cost three times as much? No, it doesn't. It only costs about 30% more. Now they've cracked the technology. But of course, if is you that want... as big as they're going to go? Uh, no, no. I imagine that soon they will get to be this size. Now you wonder, you're going to ask me, how have they got something that size when at the moment they're only producing them that size? What they've done here, Data General have cheated. They've got four separate screens here, each with its own controlling circuitry, and it works rather well. Also, of course, it doesn't reflect, it hasn't got glass in front, it's got a sort of polythene, so it cuts down on that reflection problem I was talking about. Is that as good as we're going to see? Well, if you really want the, uh, the Rolls-Royce of the display, I think this is the one. Now, you probably can't see too much difference under studio conditions, but believe me at home that that is very readable this is neither um, a VDU screen nor is it a liquid crystal display this is a thing called an electroluminescent display it's a network of a, a grid of very fine wires and at the intersection either they can light up or they don't and so you either get a, a, a pixel lit or not lovely display beautiful are you going to see these on all the other computers? I doubt it. They're very expensive. This, this micro, for example, would set you back about ooh, seven or eight thousand pounds. Oh, that's a lot, yes. Mm. What else? You How long does it last on batteries, this one? Ah, well, the grid have decided they're not going to play according to Epson's rules. They say, and in some ways they're quite right, how often you need to compute on the top of a bus or in a taxi. Mm. No, when you really need your computer, it's at the, the office meeting or uh, when you get to the hotel room. So they've opted for something which is mains powered. Actually, when we're looking at this, it's no flicker whatsoever. And, but when you see it on a television screen, you're actually there seeing it flickering. Flicker, yes. And that's because this is a 60-cycle machine, and we're operating it at 50-cycle. But in fact, it's a very stable one here. And it's yes, not, indeed. Not it's very all. easy to work with. Very so it's expensive. With. It uses a lot of battery. You know, what about storage in this machine? Well, it's got a funny sort of stuff called bubble memory. This is to overcome that problem of unplugging and losing all your data. Bubble memory is a sort of non-volatile memory. It's actually magnetic rather than electrical. And uh, it's got... 380k of that, it's got 512k of RAM, it's got 512k of ROM, so we're getting close to one and a half meg altogether. That's really quite a lot. Any discs? No discs, because the bubble memory does much the same thing. But if you want discs, uh, I can I, offer you discs here on the Data General. There you are, two drives, and they're three and a half inch, which are the up and coming system. That, you know. Nice and sturdy. Still not compatible with my IBM PC, so I couldn't use the five and a quarter inch disc uh, from that. No, well, you're asking a lot, Mac. You could, uh, you could use IBM compatible stuff on that, but if you want five and a quarter, that brings us over here to the, the Osborne. Now, this has got five and a quarter. There they are. And it does run IBM stuff. It's got WordStar in it at the moment. Um, but, of course, discs that size, a drive that size, uh, is demanding a lot of the batteries. It means they've got very heavy batteries and a very heavy disc drive. I thought Osborne had gone bust some time ago. They did. If you remember about, uh, what, three years ago, Osborne actually kicked off the whole handheld or portable revolution, and uh, they paid the price of being first in the field. As Adam Osborne said at the time, uh, if you're at the cutting edge of technology, you're likely to get yourself impaled. But they've come back with a lovely machine, and it's called the Encore, which I think is quite appropriate. That's nice. I use my little portable for electronic mail and for typing letters in and for throwing a few ideas into it, and that's about it. What are other people using them for? Well, all kinds of people are using them. You've got anything from an astronaut to a welder, would you believe? I've got a little machine back here, which is a sort of customised machine. Uh, oh, here it is. Uh, it's um, called the, the Husky Hunter, and this one is being used by social workers. It was commissioned by the GRC for social workers to go around and see if claimants are actually getting as much as they've got coming to them. For example, here's a question. Is the claimant blind with eyesight so poor they can't perform essential tasks? Let's say no. And it will go through, and it will tell you exactly what sort of uh, benefit you should be claiming. That's a very nice idea for a, a, you know, for a use from my... So, so an in inbuilt expert system almost. That's it's right, nice that's stuff. right. And there are lots of different versions of that same machine mm -hmm. husky. Some for the, the army or for welders, all kinds of things. Over here we've got a nice thing, that's the Liberator, which has been made by Thorn EMI. The Home Office commissioned an idiot-proof word processor. And uh, this is what uh, Thorn EMI have come up with. It's a very very easy to use machine. I played around with that the other day and got on with it. It's certainly time. quite small. Oh, £700. Pounds, £700. Pounds. So what we're looking for is a big screen, lots of memory. We want it to last 10 hours on its batteries. We want to have discs on it. We need built-in <laughs> communications. Ooh. Perhaps a built-in printer. One of them actually has a built-in yes, printer. Yes, that's right. Uh, actually, you're asking a lot. I think really what one is looking for is what suits you at the moment. And uh, if that's the case, well, the notes are worth looking at for this month. I'm always saying look at the notes, but please do this month. Also, these two magazines, which computer has got a review this week and portable computing, lots of information there. 
on different machines. I suppose that finally, one should say, it also should operate underwater. Underwater, yes. <laughs> that is asking a lot. Well, thank you very much, Fred. Last November, we announced our Integrated Software Challenge to find suitable applications for Lotus Symphony software. 650 viewers responded, and from them we had to choose just three. They went to Windsor in January to be trained by Lotus, the writers of the software. So in Symphony, what we have are the uh, five different work environments. The finalists are Bob Gregory, who is Sussex sales manager of an insurance company. And text into rows and columns. Mike Linskip, who has just started his own business in Newport Pagnell. And Ken Hurst, who is secretary of the Grimethorpe Colliery Band. I'd like you to carry on with spreadsheet exercises two and three, pages 130. They were each given a compact computer with 640k of RAM. The software, which itself takes up 320k and four days of training. Symphony allows you to run five different types of program, individually or linked together. It offers word processing for letter writing. A spreadsheet, which allows you to manipulate sets of figures. A database in which you can store and retrieve information. Graphs to display your results and a communications program which lets your computer talk to other computers. The important thing about Symphony is that you should be able to transfer information from one program and use it in another at the touch of a key. This is known as integration. Shocked by their own good fortune, there was only one place to go. Well, I'm retired. I'm keeping my age a secret. Uh, I was made redundant from a colliery because it was closing. My job title is secretary and I'm responsible for all administrative functions connected with the running of a top class brass band. Ken used to keep an index of the band's 1,361 pieces of music in an old ledger. Six weeks after getting his new computer, he's transferred that index onto Symphony. This means that the band will now have an up-to-date printout of all the music in their library. And on the spreadsheet side, you will see that, first of all, it says number, type, name, composer, arranger, publisher, and duration. And you can look down the uh, spreadsheet and you can see all the various things passing before your very eyes. In 1985, we're given a concert where we're going to be asked to play uh, music by Italian composers. And I want to be able to ask the computer to give me a printout of pieces by Rossini, Verdi. I would tell you another Italian composer if I knew one. And it's that kind of thing that I want from the music library and from the computer. I want to be able to do that kind of thing. But so far, I've been unable to get the uh, printer to print it out. For example, Ken's been trying to get Symphony to print out a list of all the band's waltzers, but it insists on giving him their whole repertoire. And I'm back to square one. Let's send it in cheerily. Don't want that. Ken also wanted to transfer the band's daily diary to Symphony, so that each of the day's entries would automatically move to the appropriate files already held in memory. Since the Grimethorpe Corry Band has an international reputation and is often on tour, the entries in the diary can be quite complex. So on the face of it, this is a good idea. But I don't think that Lotus have cracked that, not so far anyway. And I, I haven't any real ideas as to how to do this on my own. Mike Linskip has also been putting his software through its paces. He works from a convert at Chapel, where he runs a catering business using his mother and father as casual kitchen labour. How's it going then? Oh, it's good. So far, good. he's the only one to have got any integration.
mission working. We had a card index system which worked fine but was very, very labour intensive. Each recipe has a certain number of ingredients on it. When any single ingredient changed, like for instance butter, I had to then go through every single card that had a recipe with butter on it and change each individual card. With the computer I can now do it in a matter of seconds. With the recipe that we were cooking just now, for instance, which is Chicken Kiev, on the screen now I have the list of the ingredients for one person. We're now going to set it up so that we are preparing this meal for 50 people. So I change the figure to 50 people, enter that, it then reads out how much of each ingredient I need to order and then also gives me a readout how much it's actually costing me. Now if we have a situation where the cost of an ingredient has changed and we say for instance that the price of butter has changed from as we have it now 6p per ounce to say 7p when we then go back to our recipe the price of butter has automatically updated itself from the 6p to the 7p this is true of any recipe in the memory which involves butter the thing that I'm really disappointed about is that it won't fill potatoes or wash dishes. That's my biggest disappointment. Having said that, um, it does a lot already for me. It allows me to devote more time to doing what I should be doing, which is selling the business effectively. It will prevent me having to employ someone, which is bad news for the employment situation, but good news for me. Bob Gregory is an area sales manager of National Mutual Life. He has a network of salesmen throughout Sussex who need to be sent details of new insurance schemes quickly and graphically. Back in Windsor, Bob had hoped that the software would be able to do just that. Ultimately, I hope to be able to um, transmit information direct from my computer over to the uh, computers of several of my agents in the county. Um, it's very important to have a, a fast communications because there's going to be a lot of ideas and assistance and information uh, going to and fro between the insurance companies and their agents. And I'm hoping that the, uh, the, the software or the communications part of the software is going to be able to handle that. But Bob found there were more problems with communications than he'd anticipated. For example, each of his agents would have to buy a copy of Symphony to receive all of his messages. Bob also found the software difficult to use. I think sometimes uh, the, the system treats me with a contempt because I'm uh, just scratching the surface. I, I know a bit about computers, but the stage I was at when I won the competition was I'd, I'd more or less just learned to ride a bike and suddenly somebody comes along and gives me a Harrier jump jet. So there's, there's a lot to learn yet. Mike Linskip uses every available moment to keep studying, but he gets a bit mixed up following the manual. With some of the things it's quite simple, but I have found that the instruction book often doesn't seem to have the information that I want immediately accessible. It's either under a different heading or it isn't there at all. The manuals are a little bit involved and they're written for the American market and not for the UK market. It's not Japanese, but it is American, and I still consider America to be a foreign country. And although they're supposed to speak our language, I'm afraid that they don't. Well, so far, one thing our guinea pigs have confirmed is that real life working business systems are difficult to design and even more difficult to write for a computer, however good the package is. User friendly is a very relative term, and the wider the range of use of the package, the more complex it is to learn. This seems particularly true about Symphony compared with Lotus 123. It's certainly true that computer documentation varies from incomprehensible to incomplete and at best it's very confusing. The problem is that if the manual is clear and easy to read, it's usually a poor reference manual when you know the product well. On the other hand, reference manuals are unreadable. Symphony's solution is three manuals. 
Introduction, 100 pages. Reference, 438 pages. How to manual, 308 pages. A grant total of 856 pages to read. Well, Ken Hurst said, Americans are supposed to speak our language, but they don't. Just to prove him wrong, here's Fref. If you listen to the radio series, read the book, watch TV show, seen it live on stage, listen to the record, and are waiting hopefully for the feature film, here's something to keep you going. Oh, a long list that, and now longer by one. Currently number one in the American Games listing, it's the computer version of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And it comes complete with a microscopic space fleet, some genuine fluff, and peril-sensitive sunglasses that go dark when it gets terribly dangerous. Well, here's the author of Hitchhiker's Guide, Douglas Adams. Hello, Fred. Hi. How are you? Fine, you? I'm just fine. This, this thing you've created, I played this the other day, and I died 20 <laughs> times in the yes, first 20 minutes. It is full of extraordinary ways of dying. This is, um, I, I feel I want to explain to people who maybe don't uh, have, have a particular idea about games, this is not the sort of game where you have to shoot down aliens or chase them around mazes or whatever. This is really turning a book into a game. You become actually one of the characters. In fact, in this particular game, you become several of the characters. So you have to be aware how you treat other characters in the game when you're one character, because you may get it coming back to you. I can tell you. you one thing. I know how the computer treats me. This is downright Yes, it is. It is the first game that moves beyond being user-friendly. It's actually user-insulting, and because it l lies to the user as well, it's actually user-mendacious. Um, anyway, this is. I, I, this is. I've just started it, okay. uh, like Fanny Craddock has always got, you know, the, the half-made omelette. Um, and you start off right at the beginning. You just wake up in the morning, and it's pitch black. Mm -hmm. And you, I've turned on the light. It says, good start to the day. Pity it's going to be the worst one of your life. The light is now on. It describes the room you're in. Um, and I've already typed in the next instruction, which is get up, then take the dressing gown, wear the gown, open the pocket. So we're going to see what happens here when I press, um, when I, when I press return. It takes a little while to so the disc to spin. Very difficult, but you manage it. That's getting up. The room is still spinning. It dips and sways a little. Now, the point is this. You've actually woken up with a hangover. Mm -hmm. Your job is to find the aspirin before you can do mm -hmm. anything else. And when you open the pocket of your gown, it reveals... A thing your aunt gave you, which you don't know what it is, a buffered analgesic and pocket fluff. So I'm going to take the aspirin, or buffered analgesic, and uh, we will see that things begin to calm down, and you can, you can begin to get on with the rest of the game. But um, as I say, you have to cure your hangover before you First. can start. That one instruction you gave there was very complicated. It was almost like plain yes, English. Yes, it's, it's, it's very close to English. Yes, it is. I mean, that, it's, it's not quite as close as it as appears. I mean, there are severe constraints. What language was the program in that you could enter data like that? Well, it was written in a language called Muddle. You're kidding. Not surprising. Actually, it's MDL, All and right. it's a subset of ZIL, which is a subset of LISP. And it was actually developed at MIT by the people who now run this company, Infocom, who made it, uh, basically to do these games. It's a very high-level language which means that the programmers don't... Can, you can specialise in game design rather than being a, 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 a hacker programmer. All right, now, I recognise your distinct style in the insults that this thing's been handing back to me, <laughs> yes. but the coding, you didn't do that. Did I you? didn't do the actual coding. I actually wanted to. I asked, and they said, that's fine, OK, we'll happily teach you the language, but we think um, we would like to have the game out this year, so why don't you do the jokes and we will programme them? Well, obviously, a very experienced programmer did this. You yeah. haven't been around that long in computers, I know. No, no, no. Um, I, I started about a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. I think. Um, having, I'd, I'd made my living for several years making fun out of computers, and suddenly they turned around and bit me back. I discovered word processing, mm -hmm. and I discovered the great joy of spending three days turning a three-stroke command into a two-stroke command, thus saving time, and uh, meaning you don't actually have to do any writing at all. Well, that's time. what writing's all about, is that's avoiding right. writing. That's right. And um, so as soon as I began to discover word processing, I then began to find all the other things that computers would do, and uh, became absolutely hooked. Unfortunately, because I spent so much tra time traveling, um, um, my programming, I tend to sort of learn away from the computer, sort of sitting on aeroplanes, reading programming books. Well, it's your own fault for writing a bestseller. You wouldn't be I anywhere near so. as busy if you I hadn't done that. Done that it's a bad yeah. mistake. Now, yeah. What are you going on to do beyond this? Well, there's going to be, there will be another Hitchhiker game, but I'm also doing another completely different game for Infocom. Uh, I'll tell you it's called Bureaucracy, but I can't tell you anything more about it. Well, since that. we've all experienced bureaucracy, it's worst. There's, um, there's, there's plenty to draw on. Oh, my. Plenty to draw on. And um, 
I'm also um, getting it with a couple of friends in New York. We're st setting up a company to start doing satirical software, which is something which hasn't yet been done. A little way down the line, we have a plan for a program which I hope will be the first one ever to get burnt in the Bible Belt. Um, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a rite of passage which most media have to pass through, and software hasn't done it yet. I would like to see this one burnt. All right. Now, why do you want to go to that incredible extreme? I mean, I mean all the things you've gone through, Insults to digital watches, the bestseller to them, all of that, just to seek being burned in my country's Bible book. Why? <laughs> Why? Is this Well, it, it seems to be something that every medium has to go through, every artist had to go through it. Um, um, I mean, I'm, I, I was a great Beatles fan. I mean, anything the Beatles did, I would love to do. And their records burned. were burned, so That's right. your floppy disks should be burned, <laughs> That's right, too. Yes. Is that well, you it? see, the thing is, they've got to buy them in order to burn them. Aha. Uh -huh. Smart man. Thanks, Douglas. And if you want to try your hand at hitchhiking around the galaxy, the software available for a range of upmarket micros, including the IBM PC, the Apple II, the Macintosh, the Atari 800, and the Commodore 64. It costs 52 <laughs> or 34 pounds 50 earth money. I must say it's a tremendous about, uh, about turn designing software to actually user attack. User demolish. Oh, it's very extreme. I must have a go when I've got the courage. Mm. Now, last month, we announced the Listener's MicroLive competition. Readers had to answer some questions about computing and then suggest the names of some likely people who might be invited to the MicroLive St. Valentine's Day Ball. The question which caught most people out was one which asked, who discovered the first computer bug? Well, the answer is, it was Grace Hopper. In 1943, she was working with a prim primitive relay-operated computer when it crashed. The reason turned out to be that there was a dead bug stuck in one of the relays, so the name, like the relay, stuck. There were some very entertaining jargon-ridden suggestions for guests to the MicroLive Ball too, ranging from the obvious people like Mo Dem, she was there, Daisy Wheel, to the more inventive Benchmark, Machine Code, Synthesizer and User Friendly. The full results with explanations will be in next week's Listener, and later we'll be putting the best of the entries for the ball on the bulletin board. And if you can do better, please send us your ideas. I wonder what happened to Hugh Man Factors. I think she, he ran off with Meggie Bite. Oh. Well, this show is the last in the current series of Micro Live. We shall return in October with the weekly show, live as usual. Next month, look out for The Learning Machine, which asks whether computers are any use at all in schools, let alone at home. And we'll also be doing With a Little Help from the Chip, a series about computers and the disabled. Just to remind you, the notes for MicroLive are available. They'll cost you 50p if you write in for them. A bit less if you get them from Telecom Gold or from Micronet. Even less if you get them from our bulletin board. And if you're someone with a BBC Micro and a Teletext adapter, nothing at all. Just download them from CFAX. Don't forget that the MicroLive bulletin board will be up and running all through the summer, even if we're not on the air. So do let us have your letters and suggestions for the autumn series. But until then, goodbye for now.